I'm Rebecca Moore. I uh, <clears throat> started this program, Google Earth Outreach, 10 years ago. I just hit my 10-year Google anniversary. And uh, yay! <laughs> And uh, I've been working through those years with many of you, uh, dear friends, I see here today. Um, I am very grateful to you all for coming. Uh, many of you have come from very far away. Uh, we have people from Indonesia, Africa, Brazil, um, I think every continent except Antarctica. Uh, and so I know it's complicated to get visas and all these other things. So. Thank you for taking the trouble to come to our fourth annual, is that right, Raleigh? Our fourth annual Geo for Good User Summit. Um, this is our big event of the year for our team. Uh, it's exciting time for us to engage with all of you, tell you what's the latest and greatest in all of our Geo tools, have many of you present what you have successfully done using these tools to make the world a better place. Um, we are here to teach, but also to learn from you. And one of the points I'm going to make at the end, but I'll make it at the beginning too, is um, we're innovating very rapidly right now at Google on some of these geo tools. The next 12 to 18 months, you're going to see some amazing new things coming out. Because we've been working with you for a decade, we have some ideas of what you would like. But I want to encourage you to engage with me directly. I'm here all week. And with the team in giving us feedback, ideas, things that you would like to see us do in the future. Uh, because we do pay attention. We do implement many of them. And then hopefully that helps you do a better job in your missions. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, I thought I would just open with something fun that happened last week, uh, working with Save the Elephants. We call this a Google homepage promo, a promotion that everyone around the world, when they open the Google search, they see, now they see this little meet the Sembrero elephants in maps. This is promoting a project that Save the Elephants uh, did with us to capture using the Google Street View tracker and other imaging equipment, a very uh, immersive experience of the elephants in Samburu National Park. The goal is to raise awareness of the uh, plight they face with poaching, but also just to help make the world fall in love with these magnificent animals. Um, so you know, you click on that, it takes you into a, an experience of uh, the elephants in Street View that kids can, and anyone, can navigate. Um, millions and millions of people clicked that link and have been exposed to the great work of Save the Elephants. Um, the Charles Darwin Foundation uh, has uh, allowed us to come and work with them in um, Galapagos and capture uh, the tortoises. And not only just images of the tortoises, but the story of the tortoise migration. It turns out that tortoises migrate. Who knew? Um, and they created, I should have this as an animation, but they created a, an animation of where the tortoises go throughout the year. This has been turned into now educational content. We call it Street View for EDU. Uh, so we're developing now, working with some of you, curriculum around uh, the projects and places and uh, mission that you uh, pursue. Another thing I wanted to just uh, highlight over the last year is Google Earth turned 10. On June 29th, uh, it was the 10-year anniversary. If you opened up Google Earth for about a week thereafter, we had a birthday cake. Um, and we also launched some new content, uh, special collect street view imagery, um, near real-time imagery that was being collected by Digital Globe. Uh, links to some of the most beautiful imagery on the planet. Um, we call this the Voyager layer. And um, it's been led by uh, Sean Aske. I'll say a little bit more about Sean at the end. Um, but for example, this is an idea of some of the points uh, of, of interest that are uh, worth exploring in Google Earth in the Voyager layer. OK. So my team always insists 
that I tell the origin story, the origin myth, if you like, of Google Earth Outreach. And some of you have heard this before, um, but I hope it's like a book that you like reading twice. Uh, and uh, I'll, I will tell how we got started. <clears throat> So I live not far from here, about half an hour up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's a very beautiful area. Uh, one day in 2005, August, I opened the mail and I got this notice. Notice of intent to harvest timber. That did not sound good. The area where I live is a beautiful old growth redwood forest. It's some of the last redwood forest in the world, really. And uh, the largest stand in Santa Clara County, in Santa Cruz County. And so notice of intent to harvest timber, that didn't sound good. And then this legend did not seem particularly helpful. <laughs> Black lines mean non-industrial timber management plan area, whatever that is. And the circles mean helicopter landings, which did not sound good. So you know, this whole thing is black lines. Uh, it was very difficult for normal people, i.e. people in my community, to read this map and understand what was being conveyed in this public notice. We were worried, but we didn't know whether we should be worried or not, how serious uh, this plan was actually proposed to be. So Google Earth had just come out two months earlier. Again, to June 2005, uh, Google Earth launched. And I thought, well, what if I really studied this, figured out what they were trying to say, and then remapped it in Google Earth in the full 3D satellite imagery, would we have a better idea of what was at stake, should we be worried or not? So this is the same place in Google Earth. Um, over a weekend, uh, I brought in, and it's very easy to do this, you don't have to be a programmer, uh, I brought in the elements of the plan, uh, where they were proposing to log and how that related to um, places of importance in our community. You can do the 3D tilt. You can import SketchUp models. So working with a colleague, we built a SketchUp model of a helicopter uh, on a bombing run over the middle school. With No, they were going to be carrying, they were going to be logging in perpetuity um, using helicopters to extract the timber because it was too steep to do via road. Um, People in the community started to get involved also in contributing photographs. Like uh, this is, uh, turns out there's a beaver that live in the Lexington Reservoir below the proposed logging area. Um, Charlie the beaver is our mascot. We founded a group called Neighbors Against Irresponsible Logging, or NAIL. And Charlie's our mascot because beavers are responsible loggers, right? They, they log sustainably, usually, right? Whereas this did not look like it was going to be a responsible plan. Um, again, this is back in 2005, 2006. Uh, I was presenting this uh, plan to community members at the schools. Uh, this is a Sierra Club meeting. Everyone was trying to understand, is this something we should be concerned about or not? Uh, and it ended up people felt much more aware of what was at stake by, getting the, by seeing the details of the plan in the full 3D satellite imagery of Google Earth. And newspapers started talking about you know, empowering public participation. One of my neighbors wrote a letter to the editor. I thought I was well informed on this plan until I saw it in Google Earth. And this amazing 3D presentation gave us a, a, you know, a topographic bird's eye view of how invasive the logging will be. Um, it was picked up as a, you know, new tools for helping environmentalists do their work. Uh, one of the papers said, uh, Environmentalists used to sit in trees. Now they sit in front of Google Earth. Um, the Wall Street Journal picked this up on activists start Googling. Um, yeah, there was an article, I like this one, technology builds bigger soapbox. Uh, you know, our community had started out feeling very hopeless about whether we could even understand this. If we could understand it, could we convince anyone it was a bad idea? Because in fact, looking at it in Google Earth, we determined it was a very bad idea. Um, and again, it was picked up that this is empowering local communities, giving them a bigger soapbox. Um, Al Gore came to our aid and uh, gave us a, a statement of support. Uh, and this got picked, this was right when an inconvenient truth was out. So the local paper was like, an inconvenient truth part two. Um, 
Okay. Tonight a battle is brewing in the South Bay over plans to log a thousand acres of land. Tony Russomano shows us exactly what's at stake. We're taking a Google Earth virtual flyover along a five-mile length of Los Gatos Creek between Lexington Reservoir and Lake Ellsman in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The area in red, totaling a thousand acres, is land that San Jose Water Company wants to log. The map was created by a software engineer who lives in the area, and it's being used to galvanize opposition to the company's plans. So instead of having an abstract map, people can actually see their houses, see their schools, see where the logging zone is, and it changes an abstract concept to something that is quite striking. Yeah, I, I wanted to play that for you because I think that kind of the seeds of a lot of the projects uh, that people are doing using Google Earth are contained in this, that uh, you know, abstract ideas, you publish charts and graphs, you try to get people aware of these issues. It's hard to get people motivated. You know, I have found that using this, it not only educated people, it galvanized the opposition to the plan because once my neighbors saw this, they were like, oh my god, this is, we have to get organized, we have to stop it. Um, and in fact, it took, it took two years, but we ended up using Google Earth to prove not only was it a bad idea for water quality, increasing uh, fire danger, public safety issues, but actually we used Google Earth to prove the plan was illegal, and we stopped it. Yay! All right, come on. <laughs> so we stopped the logging uh, using Google Earth, and that, that led to... Uh, Google Earth Outreach. All sorts of groups were contacting me. I was now a, a Google engineer working on Google Earth. I had persuaded, somehow, luckily persuaded Google to give me a job to work on this stuff. And, uh, and we started Google Earth Outreach uh, because nonprofits were contacting us going, teach us what you did. How did you import that data into Google Earth? How are you presenting it to the politicians? How did you create that animated flyover? You know, give us some tips and advice. And we realized that we should create resources for nonprofits to strengthen their ability to use these tools. And then when they do so, find ways to highlight the good work that they're doing. To put, you know, the Google Spotlight can be very bright. And when we can use that to highlight the work you're doing, it can, it can help you in terms of getting volunteers, donations, impacting public policy, and so on. So our, our team has kind of now coalesced around four things, just to tell you a little bit more about us. You know, we work, we started with nonprofits and now we're working with educators, scientists, and journalists. With uh, our, our core is advancing people's training and knowledge of our tools and how they can apply to the issues they're facing. We also engage occasionally in high profile specific projects with nonprofits or a, a couple of nonprofits where we think it will really make the difference and open up a whole new area of impact uh, if we can hands-on work with those tools, those, those groups rather. Um, we do software grants. Uh, we used to do Earth Pro, but now Earth Pro is free, which is great. So now the focus there is Maps API. And then these online resources that we have on our website at uh, earth.google.com outreach where we have tutorials and case studies and so on. Um, so since that launch, it's been really thrilling to see thousands and thousands of NGOs using Google Earth, Google Maps, Maps API, Street View, all, all these tools, uh, My Maps, and so on, to impact uh, their projects in a positive way. Um, I mentioned that we get involved with some specific engagements uh, some areas we're really leaning in on, our team. Um, and here's just a, a set of some of them. Uh, there's a project that uses Google Earth Engine to attempt to eradicate malaria within 18 years. Um, the Jane Goodall Institute uh, did a Street View for Good, we call it, project to um, present the chimpanzees and their habitat on uh, Google Maps and Google Earth. Um, I'll just skip around here. Uh, you're going to hear about some of these Global Fishing Watch, Global Forest Watch, amazing projects that are attempting to map and monitor and measure uh, activity in our forests around the world and fisheries around the world. 
Uh, we're doing a lot of work with indigenous people to strengthen their communities in mapping and monitoring and defending their territory and building sustainable plans for their future. Um, we have specific focus now on education and on working with media as well. So I mentioned uh, indigenous uh, cultural mapping. This started in 2007 when Chief Almir Surawi came to Google headquarters and asked for our help in teaching his people how to defend their land against illegal invasion, illegal logging, and strengthen their ability to create a sustainable uh, economic plan for their future. He had been the first member of his tribe to go to university. And there, he stumbled on Google Earth in an internet cafe. And like everybody else, the first thing he did was he flew to his home. And you know, this is what he saw, that it is this beautiful, fairly pristine rainforest surrounded by uh, deforestation. And you can even see in the imagery places where there are invasion happening of their land. He had not seen that before. And he, he said, this is an opportunity to put down the bow and arrow and pick up the laptop as a way to defend our territory and raise awareness around the world. They've been an incredible partner to work with because people totally underestimated them. Um, why are you teaching them how to use the internet? Why are you teaching them how to use Google Android devices? What are, you know, they are highly motivated and very smart, the Surawi tribe. They're a warrior tribe. They like to let us know that. And they are now using Google Android smartphones running something called Open Data Kit, which you're going to hear more about, uh, to uh, be, perform vigilance uh, on their territory, to actually capture what's happening, when it's happening, automatically put it on a, a map, uh, upload it, expose this information, and uh, use it to strengthen law enforcement of their territory. They've also, uh, again, they were people were skeptical about whether they could do this, but they collected scientifically credible information about the carbon stock in their forest. And they've become the first indigenous-led um, forest carbon project, or a red project. They've sold now millions of carbon offsets uh, to the largest Brazilian cosmetics company. And it's transformed their lives. Um, okay. So that's like a sort of smattering of projects. Are we done? No. <laughs> um, I wanted to just spend a couple minutes. We're going to go into more depth on Wednesday about Google Earth Engine. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a teaser about it, because we are investing heavily in Earth Engine. And I want you guys all to know a bit about it. <clears throat> um, and again, I am very open to your advice on things you think we should do going forward. But here's the gist. You know, the world is changing dramatically in ways observable from space. This is deforestation in the Amazon over about the last 20 years. Google Earth and Google Maps give you the ability to look at imagery, but not actually to do science or derive map and measure and monitor this kind of change. And we were approached by a Brazilian geoscientist uh, in 2008 saying, you know, we're losing a million acres a year of the Amazon to deforestation. Much of it's illegal. Uh, but the science exists, and the daily satellite imagery exists to uh, actually virtually monitor what's happening in the forest. And, but the problem is it's terabytes of data. Uh, it takes weeks to run this analysis on the single computer we have in our institution in Belém. Um, and so by the time we get the result, it's too late. But could you, Google, allow us? You have all the imagery. Don't let us just look at it. Let us do science on it and actually make available your massive compute capabilities to let us do this at scale and much more quickly. And so this is where I say, be careful what you ask for, because we may actually do it. That idea came back. I brought that back. And we got the approval to start what became Google Earth Engine, uh, the goal being to monitor a changing planet. Uh, again, you're going to hear more about this, but just sort of a high level, there's all these satellites out there right now that are collecting incredibly valuable data. A lot of this is free public data. It's going onto tapes. This is the case of Landsat. A lot of it's going into government archives onto tapes in a vault in South Dakota. Um, 
So the data is very secure, which is good. Um, the government is performing its function of you know, collecting and securing this data. But it's not that accessible. It's not that available for people to derive meaning from it. So with one of the first things we did with Google Earth Engine was to take 40 plus years of that Landsat data, which is the longest Earth observing mission ever, going back to Vietnam War era, and bring that data all online into Google uh, data centers with access to computers for parallel processing, the high performance processing. When you have all that data, you can do things like take a set of satellite images that look like this, which are very typical, clouds and shadows, and produce a composite image by selecting the best pixels over time. You can produce these cloud-free images. Um, again, I'm kind of going off into the wonky science direction here. I don't know if it's too early in the morning for this, but, but I just think this is kind of cool. What we're showing here is as we're bringing in these strips of Landsat imagery, Earth Engine is sort of picking, OK, what is the best pixel? What is statistically the median? Again, you're going to learn more about this. And uh, composite that in. And that ends up giving you, generally speaking, the cloud-free mosaic of that, of that extent. So we applied this to all of the imagery that was in Google Earth and Google Maps. This is what South America used to look like in Google Maps. And now it looks like this. Uh, we did it for the entire world and launched that as the new satellite imagery base map derived from Landsat. It was the first 15 meter global cloud free image of the whole planet. And when we published that, there were various groups who were working, for example, to do conservation work in Ecuador. And it had previously been 80% you know, cloudy in Google Earth and Maps. They couldn't use it as a tool. Once we did this, they were like, now we can finally see where we're trying to work. Then we said, OK, well, what about time, the fourth dimension? So important on many of these issues, how the world is changing. So we stitched together three decades of planetary change in something we call time lapse, um, where at 30 meter resolution for the whole world, you've got this HTML5 video. If you go to earthengine.google.org slash time lapse, you can go anywhere on the planet. And instead of, as you zoom in, instead of it being a one-time period, it is 30-year video, essentially, of the Earth, where each frame is one year in the life of the planet. And you can see these types of phenomena, like glaciers re retreating, uh, the artificial islands being built off Dubai because they wanted more beachfront for tourism, uh, deforestation of the Amazon, and so forth. Uh, Las Vegas has been the fastest growing city in the US during this period. And what I find interesting is while Las Vegas was growing, Lake Mead was shrinking. One of the things that we try to do with these tools and these data sets is just simplify some of these very complicated uh, situations, make it easier for people to grasp what's going on. We launched Time Lapse with Time Magazine. Um, and they did fantastic reporting on what you could see, the human impact on the planet from this uh, time lapse experience. The point I wanted to make was to produce that, it was, uh, we analyzed 2 million satellite images. Um, it took about 2 million hours of computation to produce. But because we ran it on 66,000 computers in parallel, we had the result in a day and a half. Whereas on a single computer, it would have taken 300 years. So that's probably why it had not been done before. All right. So those were the early experiments we did in 2013 once we had built Earth Engine. But the key thing for us was to put Earth Engine into the hands of the community, of the nonprofits, of scientists, and so on, uh, so that they could scale their work. And this is Dr. Souza, who was the one who had pitched us the idea in the Brazilian Amazon. His methodology uh, for alerting of deforestation is now running, has been running on Earth Engine since 2012. Here we're looking at uh, areas of change uh, in the last 30 days. Um, that the key thing here is it's not just about maps and pictures, but about deriving uh, insights and knowledge and information that can impact, for example, policy. 
So every month it generates a, a bulletin, which is, uh, has dramatically cut the time it takes to produce this information. Um, then we scaled further, working with Matt Hansen of University of Maryland and his team. Uh, they moved their models for forest cover and change uh, detection onto Earth Engine, published in Science, and also the data sets are all published, uh, looking at what was the forest cover on the planet at 30 meter resolution globally in the year 2000, and then how has it changed every year since then? The thing that always surprises me in these projects is you would think that information existed already, but it had not. No, and there were entire countries that had no idea the state of their forest and how it had changed. And some of these are very important tropical countries uh, whose forests are holding some of the you know, uh, biodiversity of the planet, for example. This is a case, another case, where it took a million hours of computation but because we ran his methodology on 10,000 CPUs in parallel, we had the result in a few days, and that one would have taken 15 years. Uh, so, but it's not just about science and publishing papers and publishing massive data sets. Our goal is to help you know, work with nonprofits, people on the ground, to actually have this drive toward positive global impact. And it's been great to work with World Resources Institute. I think they're going to give a talk about this uh, on Global Forest Watch, the base map of which is the Global Forest Change map that I showed you. And there's uh, an interactive system that you can query and get uh, uh, near real-time information. This is going back and hitting Earth Engine and getting statistics. Again, you're going to hear more about this. What I liked is that IEEE Spectrum wrote an article about this, Earth Engine bringing big data to environmental activism. And they said, when a tree falls in the forest these days, it doesn't just make a sound. Now it causes a computer program to send an alert. And obviously, there's a lot of complexity in all this, right? You know, things have to be authoritative and validated. And there's many, many issues. But I really think this is the future and how we can help working with many of you that is, to bring a much more near real time picture of the planet, what's happening, where, why we should care, and get that into the hands of the people who will make a difference with that information. Um, in this case, the Indonesian government is, uh, is using this themselves. And I think you'll hear from WRI many other positive impacts that are coming from this. Just a couple of other uh, examples. Um, now Earth Engine is being applied to many, many other areas. And you'll hear about this. But one that I like, because it seems so different from forest monitoring, is um, Ali Lieber on our team is the lead program manager for public health. And in particular, this project with UC San Francisco called Disarm. And the goal is to eliminate malaria worldwide in 18 years. Uh, and starting with, for example, Here's case data in Swaziland. And because outbreaks of malaria or outbreaks, uh, can be tied to hatches of mosquitoes, and hatches of mosquitoes are correlated with environmental factors, things like rainfall, temperature, the greening of the landscape, slope and elevation, data sets that we have in Earth Engine, you can build a near real time heat map of risk, in this case, looking at where are there likely to be hot spots of, in this case, uh, mosquito hatch that would, that would be a concern. Then you can combine that with things like, uh, now I'm probably getting this not right, and Allie will kill me, but um, population centers and population centers intersected with those heat maps of risk. Uh, you can intersect with where bed nets and other interventions have already been distributed. And you can end up with that small subset of actual population centers that are actually at risk. Now, the point I wanted to make about this is it's not as if this type of modeling has never been possible before. There are lots of good tools out there that let people do it. The problem with those tools has been everyone who wants to use them has to 
source all the data themselves, keep that data current, become an expert on GIS and remote sensing, uh, build very powerful tools to bring that to the people on the ground. What we're trying to do is make all of that much, much, much easier. Uh, and again, you'll hear more about that. I think this is the last example. Uh, Raleigh may give me the hook because I take too long because I get excited. But <clears throat> you know, 20% of the seafood that we eat uh, by some uh, accountings is illegally caught. These are trawlers going out um, to do you know, massive trawling. Uh, there's a project that we've been doing with Oceana and SkyTruth. Uh, they're both here today um, called Global Fishing Watch, which is um, bringing transparency to global fishing activity. And we're looking here at trillions of data points that uh, represent ship uh, locations, and not just any ship, but ships that are engaged in fishing activity. Again, hopefully I think you're going to hear more about this. So the goal of you know, many of these activities for us is how can, how can we, with our really unprecedented infrastructure, our assets, our resources, computing, data, and so on, help you know, turbocharge the activities, the science, the outreach that you guys are doing, um, and really to make a difference on the ground. People sometimes ask, isn't it depressing, right? This is looking at uh, temperature anomaly, uh, you know, climate change that is happening. The temperature uh, 2010 to 14 compared to, you know, more than 100 years ago. Um, what can we do? People sort of feel hopeless. And I don't feel hopeless because I think we are all chipping away at this. And you can see some hope in things like this article that came out in the New York Times about restoring forest being a simple, low-hanging way to uh, reduce climate change. Um, there's incredible uh, citizen demand for action. Obviously, we've got COP21 coming up in Paris. Um, it looks like finally we're getting somewhere on those negotiations. Uh, but I like this from Greenpeace. The public should take heart. We're at a historic moment where the world is starting to wake up and to apply real solutions. The map and the data in this article is the Hansen Global Forest Change data. So the, the point is people now can know what's going on. And when you know, that's the starting point for making change. So for us, it's all about you know, working with you guys. We just, you know, we're the plumbing, we're the infrastructure, we're the electricians or whatever. But you're the ones who are creating the real change. Just a, a word on the future. <clears throat> um, there was a great article that came out in Wired, uh, timed to the 10th anniversary of Google Earth. Um, we've had various product changes uh, over the last year. Um, some of them may have been challenging for some of you, for which we are sorry, like uh, Maps Engine. Some of you are using Maps Engine, uh, and it's been retired. Uh, but on the other hand, some other changes I think have been quite positive, like Google Earth Pro being free. And the reason we'd make these changes is so that we can invest in the tools and the projects that we think are really Google worthy. And the good news is we are reinvesting in Google Earth. And I can't say a lot about that, but you're going to see amazing stuff coming out in Google Earth over the next 12 to 18 months, like a whole new, a whole new Earth. Um, Sean Aske is the engineering manager for this project, which is quite exciting. So if you want to get your dibs in on what that should look like, figure out how to bribe Sean. <laughs> um, the other thing is that, you know, just imagine we've got Earth Engine generating this dynamic information about the planet. We've got Earth as a tool that billions of people use. What happens if we put it together, right? Um, so just dream about that a little bit. And if you have thoughts for us, don't be shy. Uh, because this is a moment where we are really uh, inventing a new future. Thank Take you, Rebecca. Here's water. <laughs>